Yeah, I guess we are ready to start the session number three. And uh, the first presentation is uh, by Bob van der Linden, Stefan Nickers, and Linus Blattmeier, data change notifications for cooperative web applications. And Linus is going to make the talk. Sorry, Mark, wrong title. Well, actually, it's work done by uh, my uh, colleague, Stefan Nickers, who did all the work in the implementation. And so I actually should be the guy to give the presentation, but I um, do not. So um, I'm standing in for him. So a lot of uh, implementation stuff I know nothing about, so please don't ask me questions about it. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, well, I, you know, in abstract, so I know what goes on, but don't ask me the details. Anyhow, uh, so we did work, and Stefan, uh, PhD student of mine, team will work. And Hi, the guys. Um, so that's all about well, and so I can't explain the technical details, but I can explain you what uh, context is of the stuff. So context is actually um, this ITAR stuff we've been doing now for a couple of years, where we uh, actually work with uh, well, a well a domain specific branch. Uh, we learn a well multi-user task oriented code to distribute web applications. So I actually stuff on the web. Uh, <laughs> well, multiple users work together <laughs> using the web for the collaboration. So what you do is you describe this collaboration of people working on the web. Uh, so the idea is that you should work on all kinds of computers, laptops, tablets, mobile phones, whatever you've been using, and whatever you've been using for utilities like clouds and web servers. And this way, well, in this setting, you program things like workflow systems, like conference management systems, or home healthcare systems, where you actually produce and it's actually being used in practice. Uh, but also, multi user application, any application you can think of, uh, involving multiple users in the web. And the main thing we do is decision support systems, where you have to think about crisis management, and in particular, the crisis management that takes place for the Coast Guard. So uh, the main application we are interested in is, is uh, this kind of settings, which is a real setting uh, uh, at the North Sea, where uh, there is this huge room where people sit to control uh, disasters that might take place um, on the coast. So uh, and they, they particularly in the summer season where a lot of things going on, and uh, I've been told that a couple of hundred times a day in main season they have to go out and rescue somebody. That's very simple, like that, surfing, ships in trouble. But it could also be a real, real disaster. And all these things have to be coordinated. So uh, the game we are playing is we are uh, trying to describe their work. Because it's very complicated, things with collaborate together. And we are trying to describe their work and see if we have a formalism which is very suited to describe the work that goes on. And, and by doing this, we, we change the formalism a couple of times. Uh, and well, now we seem to be quite happy with it. And the next step we are going to take is to describe the whole application, and then uh, we hope in well, let's say two years to be able to use our prototype application uh, in a room next to this one because everything is double equipped for the case that so that we can play in a double room and see if our um, application is just well is useful for doing the work. So the main problem uh, we focus uh, with, uh, with our system is that we have to be able to coordinate all this stuff and you see all this work while well, it's going on at the same time. So there where this change notification comes from. <coughs> so, um, so it's an embedded uh, domain specific language um, and uh, well, we uh, start to see it as actually a kind of new program paradigm. Uh, because although it's you know just a library and clean, it's just functional programming, the abstraction layer it offers is so different that you when you program an application you think a little bit different than what you normally do when you write an ordinary program. Because actually the main thing you have to think about is well what are the tasks that have to be done and how are these tasks collaborate uh, 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 involved with each other. Um, so what you actually do is you program with tasks. So task is the main concept you think of when you program something. But a task can be useful in that action, can be a web service, it can be an ordinary function or a database. So uh, there's a, this really 
you know, new type of programming paradigm, you get because uh, you uh, obtain a very high level of abstraction. So you don't have to worry about many details. Uh, so, for instance, you don't have to worry about uh, generation of, of, you don't have to think about how to make a graphical user interface, or to handle user interaction, or how to handle the communication between partners. It's all being care, uh, taken care of for you automatically uh, by using the um, uh, library we've created. And in this uh, software, we make heavy use of things like uh, type generic uh, programming to do things automatically for you, given the time. So a lot of things you, you have to do is uh, well you have to inform people involved in these settings that things goes that things takes place on the other side so what has been changed and what goes on there and also that is done automatically so this talk is about well what can I do to say software you have to um, uh, make in order to inform people involved that something has changed so uh, that's about. So basically what you do when you write on an, an application is you write down actually a functional program using this library you've created. So you make a, a specification in this, this R task formalism where we have uh, interesting combinators to define how tasks are related. Um, this then uses the, the, the library and some other software we've been written and it will create a web service. So from the outside, the thing is just a web service you can talk to and you can ask this web service what do I have to do next? Or can you inform me about this and that? So it's basically just from the outside, nothing functional, just a web service you can ask information from. And then this web service can talk to all the users involved, which can make use of different type of machinery, uh, laptops or phones or tablets, and the, the interface you see might depend on the type of device you use, and you can talk to a lot of web services, which can also be iTask applications or other type of web services, or clouds, or whatever. It's on the net. Okay. Um, so, um, what we have changed uh, actually last year in the iTask system, for people who have talked before, is that uh, we, we changed uh, what the task delivers. So in the old setting, you could say, well, a task is a special type of function, which, which is correlated with the task somebody has to do. And when the task is done, it delivers some value of the type A. And uh, we have, well, we have changed that in, in, in the way that uh, a task in a new system is not something stable you will get when the task is being finished. But um, when a task is being performed, you can always see what goes on. And I, perhaps you all, all have the experience in real life when you ask somebody to do a certain task that uh, you cannot sit around and wait till something is done. But most of the time you will spend in asking, how are you? Did you already do it? <laughs> <laughs> so this is a typical fact of life. So we changed, oh, hang on. So we changed uh, the system such that it's now a reactive system. And uh, it starts as follows, it starts with nothing. So when you do a task, you probably have nothing. This is um, well, this no value thing. And then you start doing the task, and, and you can observe from the outside that uh, the task is something of type A, but it's unstable. And the unstable thing means, well, when, if you look at it next time, it may be, a, well, a different value of the same type, but it may be a, of different value. And it may be, come, well, nothing again because you're thrown away what you've done and start all over or something. Uh, so it switches from no value to value, A unstable, and it may change often from value. And at a certain point in time, you hope it will get stable, and then when it's stable, it's stable. It will not change anymore. But some tasks may not, you know, come into this area. So, for instance, if a task would be a function you would call, it will probably directly give a stable value back. But if the task would be something working on a terminal, pushing buttons, then probably it will always be unstable. It will, you know, it will never change. And the task lives for quite a long time. Actually, a task never decides when it's finished. The task goes on forever until the environment decides, given the value a task has, that the value is not needed anymore. And at that point, the task is stuck. So the ending and starting of tasks depends on what he environment of search or so on. 
Now, one of the things a task can do is it can work on shared data. Uh, and if it works on shared data, that means that somebody will, uh, for instance, updates the data, and then another one views this data. And then the idea is that uh, you see that these things are actually being changed. So here is a, a small uh, iTask program, so a couple of lines of code, but it does do a lot. And I will guide you a little bit to, uh, to uh, syntax here. So this is a function, two tasks. It gets two users as parameter, user one and user two, that are the, well, let's say the guys who should work on the, on the task. Uh, and so shared data, and well, this is an operator that says we use task in parallel. So you do task one and task two will be parallel, and task one is specified here. Task one is performed by user one, and it has to update the shared information. And task two is not a user, it can simply use the shared information. So actually that is what it does. It is the same. The type here says, well, I get two parameters, two users, and share data thing, and you get back tasks for across uh, the two results. Because you yeah, have two people working in parallel on it. So probably the results in this settings are the same, because one is updating it and one is viewing it, and hopefully it's the same. But in general, with an end, it doesn't have to be used. That's the type it is. So if you specify this, this is a very general structure. So it will work for any any type. So for instance, if uh, oh, let's put this one here. Uh, if the type would be, let's say, some data structure reflecting um, a CD uh, information of a CD database, which actually it is, the CD database of the uh, uh, data then uh, just from the type, uh, this um, user interface is being generated, which gives the user one the opportunity to, well, to, to go to the database and update whatever he likes in, this, uh, in the database. And uh, another one looking at it will see the change. So you get a kind of Google basic kind of thing where somebody is working on something and the other one will see it. Well, uh, the nice thing about this, this system is that it's, well, it's just these few lines of code and it will work for any type, preventing that we have this high task generic machinery for you available for that particular time. So uh, also, well, you know, in the settings of we are interested in this sense, of course, these types are very complicated and where people will see that something is going on in the place of the world, such as other people can come and do something about it with this information. So um, now if you look at uh, this piece of code, then uh, one thing uh, which is nice about it is not that it's, you know, it's very general, so it works for any user or any working on information of any type, but uh, this shared data stuff is actually also abstracted from. So uh, it could be anything. So the, the, the data you're working on could be shared data in memory, or it could be a file you could share, or an information system, but it could also be thing like a, like a clock, for instance, or probably you could update a clock, but in principle you can share a clock to view it and see how the time is ticking. So, uh, so this S, the S kind of thing, we call it the shared data source, um, uh, is a way to abstract for any concrete implementation of data you share with us. Um, and well, there's a paper that we committed to TFP about explaining what you can do with all this shared data, but well, to give you an idea, you can uh, construct shared data from other shared data, so you can compose things and you can have shared data uh, with a different type for reading and for writing, which you can use to have, let's say, read only shared data like a clock, or write only a shared data like a sink. Uh, but, uh, well, this, this uh, abstraction enables you to write, not to reuse code, because it can work for any type of shared data. Now, the problem is how to implement it. So that one comes apart, I know nothing about. Um, so what you need is a general mechanism uh, for any imaginable shared data structure. You need an abstraction for that, an API to address this stuff. And this API should be able to detect that something has changed. And if something has changed, all the processors which are relying on this change, want to know what has been changed, have to be informed. And uh, well, in this setting, it's very dynamic. So things are, the interest change very, very rapidly. Um, so you need kind of, well, probably subscribe system, 
special type of operating system feature which is able to deal with this. And uh, well, we could not find actually a suited solution for that. So we really have to make our own stuff, at least on a Windows machine, but we reckon we will have the same yet different problems when we use a Mac or a Linux system. Um, so uh, there, is, there is some support for certain types, but there's not support for all types, and they all work differently. And we want to have one API to, uh, to deal with this kind of thing. Also, some results you don't have to restrict that some mistakes at all. So, we also be able to deal with that. So, um, a solution also has to certify certain requirements where you have to know that something is changed, and if something is changed, all interest processes need to be informed. Uh, we want uh, the most recent value if something is, uh, is changed, uh, but we don't care about in between values. It may be skipped. Uh, and of course, you want things to be efficient uh, and stable. So here it gives you an, uh, an idea about this, this um, uh, architecture. So basically what you have is you have a web and then you have all kinds of clients uh, who want to know something about uh, at the server where all these uh, iTouch processes are running. Um, and uh, all these processes um, make use of shared data sources which comes in all kinds of averages. So what you have is you have actually uh, two tables, a process table where you have the processes uh, administrated, and you have an uh, administration uh, where all the shared data sources are being administrated. And for every shared data source, there is a list of uh, processes who are interested if one of these processes, if one of these data sources will change. So here you see, for instance, that well, uh, um, if uh, SDS number two, this one is changed, then process two, we really would like to know that. Right? So it's not so uh, uh, difficult in that sense, yeah, the But when it's, let's say if one ITAS client, uh, which of course uh, falls with process one here, um, is running, then uh, well, what you can directly do is you can kick him out of this. Uh, uh, administration because well you don't have to wake him up anymore because he's already been awakened. So you don't have you need, don't need that anymore. Um, and then uh, well what could happen for instance is that this process one is interested in let's say these two um, shared data sources. So uh, it, it can tell uh, the operating system I really want to see and know that these things have been changed. And it can do so by saying, uh, by doing a read and register, where it says, I'm this process, and I really would like to know uh, if this data source will change in the future. But it not only administrates itself as being interested in that, but you also get the recent value from that moment, uh, such that you have at least one version of the system, so that if you get a new one, then you can see if the new one, in what respect, the new one has been changed with the old one. So you all always have something to compare with it, to decide what to do with it. So then, uh, if another process is changing, for instance, uh, such a uh, data source, um, the, um, the data source will notify the operating system that this thing has been changed, and then they look at the table and say, oh, OK, these two processes have, uh, have administrated that they are in, um, uh, want to know such a change, and then uh, what you do is you simply uh, and these things as, uh, to execute in the future. So they will get a time slice in the future. And it, well, you know, when they don't start it, the process goes on like that. So actually that's what the operating system is doing. It's just a kind of public subscriber system. But um, um, yeah, uh, these SCSs can uh, tell um, the um, the sort, what kind of SDS we are to the operators. So some of these um, SDSs um, uh, will change because of action from outside, uh, and you can notify that, but not all of them can. For instance, if you have a clock, a clock, well, it's not changed from the outside. The clock is not uh, changed from the outside, the clock will simply tick. So the clock will administrate itself in the operating system that it will, you know, change on a certain time interval. So that well, everybody who's administrated that I want to see a change of this particular SDS will get uh, every time interval a notice. So if you have a view on an SDS and the SDS happens to be a clock, 
you will see the clock ticking on the screen. And, uh, and others you might not, you know, um, uh, tell the operating system at all that uh, they have been changed. So they tell the operating system, if you want to know that you really have to check yourself. So in that sense, the operating system has to pull. So that will then take care of, you know, polling, see if things have changed, and if things have changed, they will tell the system. So for the programmer, this is fine, because for the programmer, it doesn't matter what they, these things actually are. He simply uses them, and he does not care, you know, how these things internally in real life, whether it's done by polling, or by ticking, or by changing. So that's the idea. So, actually, that's what I want to tell. So, for a programmer, it's very nice, of course, he can use these resources, and he can post them, and combine them, and he doesn't have to worry about how they really work. Well, somebody has to think about it, so um, uh, if you implement this thing, you have to make uh, special versions for this um, uh, API uh, for every type as, as you make. So the, the implementer has to take care of that. We're doing that. So he has to make instantiation, instantiation for every type of the SDS. And well, for time machine, you'll have to do something different than for systems that need to be followed. Um, well, this is it. And the API can also be used for non ICAS applications, but it's especially made for that, especially soon after that. And, well, it's fun to program. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank yeah. you. Questions? Jeremy. Yeah. This sounds very much to me like event driven programming. Is, is it the same thing? Well, for, it depends on for whom, whom you are talking. So the, the, the one who writes an ITASK program, he doesn't see events at all. Of course, of course, of course. In, in the picture you saw with, with this piece of code, you had something, somebody who updates, uh, had an update view or capability of update something, and somebody who just looks at things. And that's it. They don't have to do anything at all. You know, if uh, uh, the user of the application would change something, then the one who views the thing will see it. So you, you don't see an event-driven uh, system for the, for, well, for the programmer at all. You don't write event loops or whatever. It's not yeah, no, no, that's not the same thing. But, yeah. uh, so event, so event, some, some event driven programming is about wiring um, systems together out of components, which some of which fire events and some of which listen for events. Uh, yeah, and it, basically it happens, always happens, of course, in every application you listen to events and you handle them. Yeah. But for a programmer you don't see it. For a programmer it's just these two lines. And he doesn't have to do anything else. This, this, is, this is the code to write. So it's only two lines of code and that will do what I showed you. And then of things, you can have much more complicated things, so there's a different talk about what kind of uh, ways you have to combine tasks. But that's the interesting thing, of course. Oh. How, how can you combine these tasks and how are they wired together? And that's much more interesting and much more. Uh, right. But it's a different talk. I will we'll have to explain this to you. But it's um, is your is your combinator API in the paper? Because I'd be interested to see how it corresponds to sort of. Because it looks like it, this is sort of a reactive API, right? It's, it's a reactive API, API. Yeah. yeah. So no, it's not in this system. But I can give you a copy of the paper. It will be presented as P P P. Okay. Because I'd be copy Okay. Are you done? Yeah. So. Um, I understood from some other source that you can actually send over functions over the yes. network. So you yes, can, we can. Uh, yeah. We can also um, send functions that be executed on the client, for example. That's also possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the question if you can is yes. <laughs> the next. I was expecting the next question, but how? Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> how? Uh, yes. <laughs> 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 Please provide some details. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, if you, if you um, let's say, once it's on the client, so you can execute any of these tasks on the client, uh, we will compile actually a clean, a clean program twice. And, uh, and, and so we have two images one image running on the server, which we can distribute to other servers, but one on the client for running on the client, which is actually ends up with an, uh, a thing in, in JavaScript. Right. So, yeah. And then we can construct a closure. <coughs> and, uh, with this closure, uh, that we can use to determine which code to send to the client. Right. 
the next one, yeah, we will send the code to the client and then it can be executed. All right. Yes, yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Short? Yeah. Is it fair to say that you implemented the observer design pattern? Could be. <laughs> On steroids, probably. Could be. So a new variant of this, or an instance of some of the known variants? I, I don't know. Yeah. It's clearly an, an observing thing we, we, uh, we've implemented, yes. But um, I don't know which values are, are and exist. And, yeah. Kind of. In kind of. In abstract hope probably yes. In details probably no. Yes. Okay, let's thank Prince again.